Conscient Podcast, Episode 181 Ecofeminist Artist, Dawn Dale Go to a farm and take a carrot out that's still dirty and wipe it off on your pants and you know eat it on the spot. It's something that, that most people don't have access to anymore. You know? And so that, that loss of the contact with, with the natural world is having a radical impact on how people view it, how they value it, and how they seem to be willing to let it go. Not realizing that um, we depend on the natural world. We are part of the natural world. And if we screw it up, we're gone. I had the pleasure of spending an evening with Don Dale and other artists at an art and ecology potluck at our home in Ottawa on April 7th, 2024. Dawn spoke about her artwork and in particular her Alfar sculptures, whose distinguishing feature are animal ears, perfect for listening to nature, and how they ground her to the earth by creating a calming yet energizing presence. I was intrigued to know more about these alfars and do check out her website to see what they look like. I was also intrigued about her art practice in general. And so we shared a pot of tea, dandelion tea, at a rather relaxed pace in her kitchen in Gatineau, Quebec on May 29th, 2024. Dale's work is primarily focused on eco-feminist art, realized in large-scale outdoor, site-specific works, ephemeral organic installations and gallery spaces, as well as by and through experimental drawings. The Alfar series came about much later after she was in Unfortunately, a bus accident which curtailed her ability to realize those large-scale works. In just a few minutes, you'll hear Dale speak about her elemental paper clay work that come out of 3D demonstrations of wax and clay wax through the years of teaching at the Ottawa School of Art. These intuitive portraits of the elementals, or alfars, that populate her imagination and surroundings of her home occupy a lighter side of her environmental concerns as she continues in the historical precedent of bonding the world of humans to the realm of nature through anthropomorphized creations. Dale's love of nature and art is contagious, as you'll hear, as is her concern for them. For example, I appreciated this insight about the role of art. That's one of the things about art, is that art is a reflection of the things that we value. We'll start with a soundscape recording in her backyard, which I think sets the tone nicely for our conversation. We'll also conclude with a soundscape from that space. Hey, Don, welcome to uh, Conscient Podcast, and thanks for welcoming your home here in uh, Gatineau, Quebec. Ah, thank you for coming out. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to do this. Well, you know, it's an ongoing series. I, th- I think this is like going to be like episode 180 or something. And yesterday I did a, an interview for a Collapse Cafe, uh, or Collapse Club, rather, 
uh, which is a group of people who are collapse aware and thinking about that. And they asked me all kinds of questions I couldn't answer. And I thought, oh, it's so hard <laughs> to be interviewed because, you know, you don't know what questions will come up. But in your case, we're going to talk about your artwork. And we only, we've only we met a couple of times, and m most recently at my house, we I, I keep telling listeners of the podcast that uh, I'm doing a potluck called Art and Ecology, and and I encourage people to do these local uh, gatherings of, of like-minded people. It could be artists, it could be activists, but we need to talk to each other, we need to have a sense of solidarity. So thanks for being part of that group. And um, what we're going to do today is talk about your work, and I just saw some of the beautiful... Uh, figurines, I think of them as in in your studio here. We won't walk through everywhere, but you'll you'll describe them, and then um, yeah, we'll talk about uh, you know the origins of the work and what your what what work you aspire to do you know in the future because you're you're um, you're very active as an artist. So why don't you just start by telling us your background, like your education and some of your training, and uh, so that people can get to know you. Okay, I uh, originally come from Alberta, a uh, very small conservative uh, town, uh, might as well give the name Red Deer, uh, where uh, at the age of 18, young people head off to either Edmonton or, or Calgary as fast as they can to get out of the atmosphere. Um, I was originally slated to go to, uh, to Nate or to Sate, which are technical schools, because I'm profoundly dyslexic. And uh, <clears throat> thanks to the Alberta education system, I somehow managed to squeak through the, uh, the English program and uh, decided to go to university. At that time, university was relatively inexpensive. You could work for a summer and save enough money for tuition and uh, room and board over, the, over a term, which I did. So uh, my mother wanted me to go into math. She thought that art was absolutely useless, didn't want me doing it. She's wrong. I know she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she's not here. Uh, but it was the whole idea. Uh, in the end, when I got to uh, the University of Alberta, I uh, thought, I'm just going to sign up for one art class. Just let me have one art class. And uh, so I went, and they said, no, 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 you don't want to take just one class. You want to take the whole program. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I don't have a portfolio, you know, to, to, to offer. And they said, no, don't worry. Just, you know, so I signed my, my year away to the fine arts department at the University of Alberta and absolutely loved it, found myself at home, found where, you know, I, I felt like I, that's where I needed to be. But I also discovered that I was extremely naive and Coming from a very small town, I had a lot of growing up still to do. So I uh, dropped out and headed to Europe, as many young people did at that particular time, in the uh, you know late 60s, early 70s. Uh, <clears throat> traveled around Europe by myself, came back, uh, did a whole series of odd jobs, and finally ended up uh, in um, child care services with the city of Ottawa and uh, working with Native, uh, and well, at that time we called them Native and Métis children, Indigenous you know, children <clears throat> in the inner city. Absolutely loved it, but burnt out in the end, and went back to university, uh, deciding to be a little more practical, decided to go into education, but fell in love and ended up moving you know, here to this region mm -hmm. with, to be with the man that I fell in love with. Right, and raise a family, but always art has been a through line in your life. I, th I can see it all around us <laughs> here in your home. And by the way, we're, we're, there's some wonderful sounds here. We're, we're doing the recording inside because it's the, the rumble, but there's a, there's a chipmunk. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just lovely. It's, it's, we're really, really privileged in the sense of living in town, in the city, but uh, also living on an acreage. So we have a well, we have a septic system. It's just like being in the country. Mm. And uh, we've set up the, uh, the yard in such a way that uh, it's, we, we re rewilded it. That's the expression they use now. At the time, it was, for me, the idea of the concept of zeroscaping. And it just, it was, part of it was uh, the practicalities because when you're on a well, you don't want to be watering a, a nice green lawn all the time. You want to... Uh, let nature, you know, do its thing. And so I think we're one of the few houses on the block now that still has uh, fireflies in the summertime. Mm. 
you know, that, that with all the lawns, with all the chemicals, with all the other stuff that people still insist, even when it's a country-like road, like that you drove up, that, that people somehow seem to think that the long lawn is king, you know. Well, I can see you're walking your talk in terms of ecological living. Um, how would you describe your art practice, Don? I would also consider my art practice to be ec ecological. In fact, uh, I got to a point where uh, people like to label <laughs> one another, so I decided to label myself, and I consider myself to be an eco-feminist artist. Mm. That's the, the term that I use to describe myself. Uh, but I was also in a, in a great position of privilege in the sense that um, being in this region with the artist-run centers, the women's community, in, in terms of the arts community here, being at the uh, University of Ottawa in the Fine Arts Department, there was a group of us that got together and supported one another. And it was the idea that um, there's a new term. <laughs> it was not a new, new term, skill sets that you need to be, you know, a successful artist, in quotation marks. Um, I kind of abandoned that um, and just decided uh, and, and was in a position of being able to do it, um, that I could explore and do things that were, you know, uh, important to me, that I didn't have to satisfy a curator, a grantor, a buyer, or anything like that. Plus, I don't, I don't have the skill sets for grant writing. I don't have the skill sets to be an entrepreneur. Um, but I was very, very fortunate that I've shown in, in most of the galleries in the region mm. and in doing installation work. So what is your artistic process or what does your art look and feel like? Um, because it, I, I know there's an ecological connection, but I'm trying to uh, how, how would you describe it? With, with the older work, uh, the idea of the term land art. Are you familiar with the term land mm -hmm. art? Yeah. So in terms of land art, I had the opportunity to work outdoors. Uh, I was able to go to the BAMP Center for one entire summer with my daughter uh, and, and do a whole series of projects around the grounds. Um, worked with some wonderful people uh, with a, um, a collective called Art Terror working out in a community called Lange Gardien, people who had a, a large acreage, I think it was 140 acres, and we did two, two years of, of projects out there. The problem is that, that with groups, sometimes things get very intense, and sometimes <laughs> groups implode, and that's what happened with this particular group. But there were other groups that um, we discovered had preceded us. There was a, a group called uh, Boreal, a uh, wonderful woman named uh, Lorraine Gilbert and uh, her partner and some other people uh, in Quebec ha you know, have, been d have been doing land art. Um, since Art Terre, there's been other groups you know, that have sort of you know, sprung up. And it's a question of being able to survive for a couple of years and then you know, somebody else takes on the mantle and, and sort of inviting people out to the land to have uh, the experience of being you know, in the land, but also uh, having work that's experiential, that uh, relates very intimately to the land that it's, it, that it's placed within. Well, I'm familiar with land art, and I know that there's many artists who would call themselves ecological, and they might or might not use feminist, but I, uh, I guess it's interesting for me to know that there, you've had a long body of work and, and a long history of creating art with materials, natural materials, and that, that I think, is not new at all, right? It's, it's no. something that's always happened. But in the, these days, as the ecological crisis worsens, uh, some artists are saying, well, ecological art is all the more important because it uh, has a process or a method methodology that's connected or that is in relationship with the environment as opposed to exploiting it or ignoring it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, w I would love to continue, but it's a question of health and f physica physicality that I'm just no longer able to, to, to do the, the physical work that I did before. I think when you saw, I sent you a picture this morning of me out in a field. It was like six o'clock in the morning. The sun had come up for a while. Uh, a wonderful man named David Harper had taken the picture. I didn't even know that he had taken it. Um, but that was the kind of work that I did based on that idea of manual labor. 
because I, I, I come in part from a farm family. My, my parents, well, my mother specifically was the last generation, you know, on, on her farm. Um, and in, in terms of my family, it was very much a matriarchal type of lineage. Uh, I was also really, really lucky to, to, to have the extended family of aunts. Uh, that sort of kept me. Not the little, not the little ones. Uh, you, <laughs> I think people in the east call them aunties, but uh, in the west we call our aunts. We, but we would say Auntie Gladys, Auntie Annie. You know, all these all these women who who were very much a part of of uh, keeping my world together as my parents were falling apart, kind of thing. And so, um, having goats around, having big gardens, um, having um, mixed farm practices, you know, being involved, you know, spending summers out with one particular aunt, riding horses through hay fields and all, all sorts of things. It was just a kind of childhood that just no longer seems to exist for, for people. Even people who live on farms, because farms have become so industrial and so large that that kind of I idyllic, bucolic, you know, uh, Life just doesn't exist much anymore. Well, the relationship between art and farming is something I'm learning a lot about, and uh, a lot of my artist friends are also farmers as mm -hmm. a way to stay, and I don't mean it as a pun, but grounded yeah. <laughs> uh, in, re in, in a type of reality and also as a healing practice when they're dealing with complex issues like climate emergency and you know societal collapse. And so there's this uh, grounding through, through farming, which I don't do personally, but many of the people around me. So I'm interested in that connection between art and farming. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and some would say they're the same thing. <laughs> in the a way. art of farming. No, <laughs> farming is, is a very a very intense practice. And, and for me, uh, a lot of my uh, indoor installations also had to do with, with the practice of, of food production. And so a lot of my, uh, I did a lot of work that was on the floor. Uh, I did work that then went on to tables so the idea of a table as being a meeting place, an eating place, uh, a place where, where food is made and served, uh, shelving, the idea of preservation, uh, p being able to preserve you know, foods. Uh, so part of what I've been able to do on this small plot of land that we have is, is every year uh, going out into the neighborhood, not as much anymore, but uh, just gathering things. So accumulating and gathering. Um, all sorts of different organic material, and then putting them in a, uh, an aesthetic arrangement. Uh, and I've, I've loved the process, and I find that, um, sadly, not a lot of other people do it, maybe because <laughs> it's very in labor. It is very labor-intensive, and it's very ephemeral. And, uh, but the thing I like about it is that uh, it takes people to a whole different place that they walk into a gallery expecting to see sculpture, they expect to see paintings, drawings, things on the walls, and suddenly there's something that smells ever so wonderful, that just the oral factory sense of, of some of the older installations that I had done. Um, just, and being able to examine things and look at things, you know, and, and, and see things that are common every day things that they cook with. So one of my first materials that I worked with was eggshells. And it was as a student, uh, you don't have a lot of money, you eat a lot of omelets, you know, you eat a lot of uh, hard boiled eggs, soft boiled <laughs> eggs, any kind of eggs that, you know, it was uh, something that was readily available. But for some reason, I started just saving the eggshells and composting was not a thing at that time. This was back in the you know, mid-70s, I, um, I didn't want to throw them away. So they would end up in, in, in the wash. I would wash them, and then they would pile up on the counter, and then they would end up in a box under my bed because I didn't know what to do with them. And then I started drawing them. And then uh, I developed uh, allergies at, at uh, the University of uh, Ottawa to uh, the chemicals that we were using in uh, lithography. And... Uh, 
my professor very kindly said to me, Dawn, printmaking is dead anyway. What do you really want to do? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, so I ended up uh, bringing in one of the boxes because I had continued that practice from Alberta onto, you know, into when we were living in Hull. And I just brought in a couple of the boxes of eggshells and I said, these speak to me. These, this is what I want to work with. And he said, go for it. And just left me on my own to do to do what I wanted to do. So that was when I did my first installation. Mm. Well, when you were at our house, we were talking about um, these projects of, of elf-like uh, figurines that yeah. have big ears. And that right. kind of perked my ears because I'm a listener, you know? Yeah. Uh, so maybe tell me about that project because I, I, I've actually seen it and then they're beautiful, um, um, evocative, uh, sculptures. Thank but you. What's the, what's the story behind them? <laughs> uh, the story started off very quietly uh, at school. Um, I would do demo pieces for for classes, uh, sculpting a face, <clears throat> and then uh, I said, "There's the idea of learning the technique, you know, of 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 sculpture, but then there's the fun of the imagination and creativity that you bring into it, and you can do all sorts of things." And for some reason, I kept doing these elf-like ears that would just sort of pop off the side of a head because it was something that was very quick, it was fun, it captured people's attention. And, you know, they would get squished down, they would go back in the, the wax ball, they would go back into the clay supplies. And then I saved a couple. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in 2010, I, I was in a bus accident, which kind of curtailed a lot of the physical activities, the larger installation pieces that I was able to do. And somebody said, well, why don't you just play with those heads that you're always playing with in class, you know, see, see where that goes. And so I sort of thought about it and thought, okay, yeah. And um, at school, um, there's a lot of materials that are just left behind. People don't know what to do with it, so they just abandon it. So I was able to bring home bags of, of, of um, clay and recycle it, uh, bags of, of wax. Uh, but the wax is very fragile, and, and I didn't ultimately want to turn any of these things into bronze. Bronze doesn't speak to me as a material. So I, I just kept going with the clay, with the recycled clay. And the school was kind enough, and I should mention this, it's the Ottawa School of Art. They were kind enough to let me fire my pieces there at the school. And um, so I continued that and um, really enjoyed it. It was something that was within my physical range that I was able to do at the time. And then uh, on a trip to uh, Florida, uh, I saw people working in a workshop. I just kind of wandered into it and sort of backed up politely and thought, but just in a second I saw a material that I went, mm-hmm, this, this is something that, that I wanna, that I could work with because um, with clay, uh, it is a very, wonderful material it's very sensual it's uh, from the earth it's of the earth but it's the BTUs to fire the stuff that it's sort of you know I, I found that uh, it kind of didn't sit well with my my sensibilities um, and this material that I found in Florida was a paper clay a Japanese paper clay and uh, suddenly I was untethered from the kiln and uh, spent a year playing with it to see you know where I could take it where it would go how far I could push it still doing that because it, it is it's a it's a wonderful material but I also make my own paper mache and uh, so it speaks of the woods that I live in it speaks of a material that is uh, renewable because it, it's a cellulose based material it speaks of uh, the idea of uh, Low tech. I really like the concept of low tech for some reason. Um, just all of those factors brought together, and then in, in terms of the idea of um, the the Elthar, I'm uh, I'm of that generation, you know, that read Lord of the Rings when it came out in you know hardcover book, and everybody was reading it. And then I, I uh, I'm a, a great lover of science fiction and some science fantasy. It has to be something that's socially relevant. Uh, I'm, I'm not into the great wars or anything like that. Um, but just the idea kept creeping up on me. And, and also, 
in looking at a lot of contempt, and this is one thing in terms of my own practice that I try and make part of it is, is I love looking at other people's work. But I also want my work to be my work. I don't want it to be derivative of other people's works. I don't want to take other people's ideas. I don't want to. Uh, and I had seen so much work um, that was all about women. And uh, I thought, well, where are the men? <laughs> you know. And so the idea of, of uh, my partner being, in a sense, my muse, very quiet, gentle man uh, who uh, just sort of a woodsy hermit type of character. Uh, and I could, you know, sort of see these ears <laughs> off as I had all the time, the big beard. And so I did. I, I turned him into my muse. And, and the idea, um, and I guess we all do this, having a sense of, okay, I have to rationalize why I've taken this step into this huge rabbit hole and, and I'm loving it so much, is I realized it had to do with the idea of listening, you know, um, that, that acute sense of listening, the idea of needing to, to, to learn to listen to nature, that people have become so removed from nature. And uh, there's a little subtext, because it's something that I struggle with personally, is the whole concept of uh, predator-prey. So with the ears, you get to choose. There's, there's, no, there's no defined sense of, you know, this is a prey, this is a predator. These are just, you know... Um, these these people, mostly men, most of them are men. Until uh, my cousin said, "Don, you really have to do, you know, some alpha that are women. You know, if this is our our Icelandic heritage, this is something you want to consider. You know, think of the ants or the aunties, as <laughs> as we call them. Uh, and um, so, yeah, they've they've diverged. You know, they 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 sort of coalesce into something, and then they diverge for a while, and then they come back." So um, after 1,111, uh, I managed to keep going for some reason. That was, that was part of the goal, was to, to do 1,001 and being able to edit out, you know, 10% of them. You know. What kind of impact do you think this kind of, I don't know if you call it ecological art, but it's certainly uh, informed by either mythology or story or however you describe it, mm -hmm. what kind of impact does it have on audiences and how does it make us more connected to the issues that we face? Or maybe it's a diversion from that, I don't know. I've... I haven't had what I feel is, is ample time, and part of it is, is just... Uh, because of, of, of sort of moving away from things because of my accident and then with the pandemic, the isolation of the pandemic, not being able to uh, sit around and watch an audience and see how they're reacting and responding. One of the things that I did after um, several small showings of them around the region was that, that uh, in fact, men were attracted to them, that this was something that I really... Was. <laughs> yes. but but that's that's one of the things about art is that art is a reflection of the things that we value you know or, or the things something that's that's a representation of us that that says yes you exist you're here you know someone needs to to and that that was part of the impetus for me was that I kept seeing all of these sort of contemporary uh pieces because I am I I do Facebook and I do Instagram you know, I did as as a mother. I did I do it as a teach. You know, I did it as a teacher, just to see you know what was happening in the art community. Seeing all of these images of of beautiful women, and I kept thinking, where are the beautiful men? There's so many beautiful men around, and there, there's so many gentlemen and men who are involved in nature. Why why aren't they represented? And so that was, you know, what part of what wanted me to keep going, you know, in what I was doing. Well, in this podcast, I always inevitably come to the question about the role of art in not just visual art, but all of the arts. And so, right. Um, you've created a lot of art. And you've seen a lot of art. What do you think the role of art is 
in the present moment? What can art do or what should art do more of to be more engaging and play a larger role? I guess that's my question. I think art has shifted, you know, uh, in terms of the whole 20th century. You know, um, I became part of a wave uh, at, at university where most of the women and uh, most of the, excuse me, most of the students in in the classes were women. You know, and and suddenly women were making art about being women, and um, so something again that idea of representation, the idea of Ella. Um, being valued, being validated, um, being seen, you know, and, and I think that that is one of the things that, that art can offer. I think in terms of if we look at the Canadian art scene, uh, the, the, the sort of through the lens of the artist-run centers, because that was something that I've been, you know, very active over the years, is to see the different groups that have been marginalized over time you know, finally being able to step up and have, you know, representation, to have a space and a time, a place to see their work, to meet their community, and to offer, you know, to the community at large, you know, what they're doing. I, th I think that's something that's really important. So the black community, the women's community, the, the queer community, all of these communities that have stepped up and said, you know, uh, we want to be seen. We deserve to be seen. We are part of the, the fabric of this of this land, you know, and and here we are. And by being seen, you also are heard, and yeah. your voice uh, it contributes to you know, either critique or reinforce, or the absence of the voice is really the problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and in terms of the artist-run centers and and. Uh, especially a place like Saw, which uh, had uh, Club Saw. So it wasn't just mm -hmm. visual art, it became performance art, it became music, it became um, drama, all sorts of opportunities that people were given a venue in which to develop, create, share, and learn from, and learn from one another in, in terms of having the experience of, of being within this, this creative milieu which I think is really important. I, th I think um, not to be caught up in, in something that's ultimately commercial. You know, we'd all be doing landscapes and flowers still. <laughs> well, when I was at Canada Council, there wasn't a day when we didn't talk about those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. You know, what is art? What is the commercial side versus the... Um, you know, the words escape me. And, the, and, and the words don't matter that much if the freedom is there for people to express themselves and to dialogue and to engage in the work. But we live in a very controlled society where the digital technologies and the corporations are trying to brainwash us and sometimes they're trying to greenwash us and sometimes you don't know what they're washing, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a process going on there. And the arts uh, sometimes get co-opted by that. Uh, but mostly artists hold on to their own, right? And and they do their work, and they're either counterculture or they're um, fighting to not only be represented, but to uh, present a point of view that's not that is um, trying to balance things out or to find a way to to break some of that hege hegemony. Um, and your work as an artist. Uh, uh, how do, you, how do you feel that what you're doing now uh, or what you want to do, I know you're slowing down a bit because we're all getting older, <laughs> but what, what do you aspire to now as an artist? What, do you, what would you love to do that would be you know, helpful to our world? I, th I think it's, uh, it's a tough one. You know, I, I, think, I think about it a lot, and, and sometimes I wonder... Uh, what is possible? You know, sometimes I get uh, depressed. Sometimes I get very sort of nihilistic, cynical. Uh, but I think it's ultimately the key word is hope. Offering people some sense that, uh, yeah, if, if we uh, get ourselves together, if we look at the issues, you know, um, that are facing us and uh, look for the solutions and I think this is one thing that in terms of the creative community is that there's there's these two very specific areas there's the technical expertise that we develop in whatever our practice is 
but there's also the creative element. And, and when you have that opportunity to be, to be creative, the idea of the, the term that's used, thinking outside the box, uh, is that, that creative- Blow up the box. <laughs> blow up the box. Uh, is, is the idea of uh, offering solutions that are outside, you know, that this sort of the mainstream thinking, you know, that there, there are other solutions. And there are younger artists in, in the community that, that I very much appreciate. There's one uh, in particular who, who is very much taken on the mantle of being an ecological artist. Her name is Emily Rose Michaud. I hope you have an, a chance to interview her in the future. Uh, you know, she's doing all the things that I was doing, you know, 20 years ago, but she's doing them uh, even better, which is, which to me is, is what should be happening, that each generation is, is working off the shoulders of the last generation, but they're making it relevant to their time, and they're making it r much better than, than we had the opportunity. Can you give an example of what she's working on or some of the themes? She's been working on, uh, she just had a, a show recently at the uh, Imagier, uh, centre, uh, centre de la, <laughs> mess this up. Centre d'exposition d'Imagier uh, here in Aylmer. She had a wonderful exhibition about uh, the river. And I had done a piece about the river in the park behind the gallery in 1997. And here it was, you know, 2023. Um, and this beautiful, you know, these works, you know, that she's been working on very carefully, very slowly, very meticulously using, you know, uh, processes that she's comfortable with, that she finds ecological to her purposes, um, and and just trying. And this is the thing, is that, that, that art can speak in very loud, aggressive ways, but it can also speak in really quiet, gentle ways, and just sort of poke and prod and, you know, look at this, think about that, listen to this, you know, and and... I think that's the thing about art is that that it has a visceral component to it, that it that it's and and with this little pile of books that I put out for us, is that there's one book uh, called uh, Sacred Balance by David Suzuki, and one of the things that he talked about was the idea of uh, being a scientist and having the facts and wanting to share the facts, and he thought if he shared the facts, people would act. So for 25 years, you know, uh, working with CBC. He, he did all these wonderful programs and realized that, yeah, people were listening, watching, but not much was changing. And he realized that if you want people to change, you have to hit them in terms of, and I, that's the wrong word, I don't want to use that word, you have to touch them in terms of their values, you know. And, and, and open up that sense of values to include the environment because a lot of people have lost touch, as we were talking with previously. They've lost touch with the environment, that it's something in a video game, it's something in a movie, it's something um, that you drive through, it's something that, that has been turned into a virtual world, but to actually have the opportunity to, to, to walk under the trees, to, to go to a farm and take a carrot out that's still dirty and wipe it off on your pants and you know eat it on the spot it's something that that most people don't have access to anymore you know and so that that loss of the contact with with the natural world is having a radical impact on how people view it how they value it and how they seem to be willing to let it go not realizing that um we depend on the natural world. We are part of the natural world. And if we screw it up, we're gone. Well, the scientists are connectors, the artists are connectors, the educators, the nurses, they're, we're all trying to stay alive and to have um, rich lives, but rich lives is, are not necessarily material things. I mean, we have to have homes and food, but to me, a rich life is, is sort of what you're doing, which is surrounding yourself with beautiful things and beautiful people and a, and a process of 
a, a relationship with with the land and the people and the more than humans and I know not everyone can do that, but it's actually there's life everywhere, right? So why can't we just slow down, simplify, and you know there's there's this notion of progress, but I'm really questioning that that uh, I understand progress in terms of policy. You know, you want to make things more accessible, but we think that that the world, if it goes faster and if we consume more, we'll be happier. And there's some madness there. And and what I like about your you know 30, 40 years of work as an artist is that there's a through line there. You've you've sort of consistently said, I'm an eco feminist artist. This is what I do. And and. And now you're nurturing, or you're working with other younger artists, and so I'm wondering what what what's your legacy as an artist now that you know you're, we're we're both on the older side of life, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, not that you need to have a legacy, but what is it that you're feeling you want to 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 leave behind, or or to advise uh, younger artists? You've already given some advice, but is there anything else you'd like to add? I, I think it's it's. Uh, I wouldn't call him, I wouldn't call myself a mentor. I've 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 been a teacher for many many years, and I have students who have sort of picked up on on some of my sensibilities. And there's a, a young woman who actually lives in the region, um, <clears throat> Martine Chatrin. She does she also does work about water. That's one of my major themes, and she uh, she has created a practice for herself that's very rigorous in the sense of being. Again, very low tech, but it's photography. And so she creates pinhole cameras. She works with Sinotype. She does all of this work that uh, she creates her own dyes, her own papers, all of these things that um, she's making the effort. And uh, it's not easy because, again, it's very labor intensive. But uh, she's given herself that challenge. and, And so far, she's met that challenge now it's the issue of trying, and that's always the dilemma for artists, because you can. You can hide in your studio and create all day, every day, uh, but it's to get the work out there, to, to find a public, to find people to communicate with. And you can preach, preach to the converted, because again, uh, they go, oh, right, I'm not alone. You know, there's other people who are, you know, in, in the same sensibility that I am, but also... To, to have somebody wander in and just to be com- caught completely off guard and to go, what is this? Uh, whoa, wow. And, and just to be enveloped in it and, and become engaged in it. And, and it's that, it's, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about art is that it can. It, somebody can just sort of be wandering through a space and go da, 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 da. And then suddenly... Something just grabs them and holds them and says, please look at me. Please sense the voice that's here that wants to talk to you. W- what are you feeling when you see me? What, how do you feel? You know, all these things. And, and, and because art is experiential, that's one thing that I have this love-hate relationship with in terms of Facebook and Instagram is that too many people are looking at these little teeny tiny images on their phone And not realizing that part of the experience of art, music, anything, you experience not only with your heart and your mind, your whole physical body is engaged when when you're looking at something. If you allow it, if you allow it to enter in, you know, and that's one of the things is if you catch somebody off guard, you know, you're, you're, you're halfway in. To, to, to having a dialogue with them. And I think that's really important. <clears throat> and I've been interested in community arts recently. I've always have been, but in particular recently, so that we know what people are looking for as well. You mm-hmm. know, how can we listen to the needs of people? You know, somebody who's having trouble finding a place to live is not necessarily going to be very interested in art unless the art somehow brings them something that, that helps them either find a home or... Or, or uh, you know, deal with the stress and strain. And uh, I was reading a, a series of blogs called Manifesto for Now, and I'm I'm just uh, becoming familiar with uh, those who are saying, you know, we need to listen more carefully. And you used the term "listen" earlier in this conversation. Listen to the to to the public, to listen to the earth, but also listen to 
And so the, the idea of, of offering is wonderful because artists offer, you know, sensibilities, but also to listen to, to where people are at and what kind of art practices might be helpful to them wherever they're at in their lives, you know, I think mm-hmm. is a big part of it as well. I think as, as being a teacher um, and seeing how people transform when, when you have someone who comes in from a, a high, you know, stressed bureaucratic job and they sit down at a table and they start to play with the clay and they realize that almost three hours have gone and they've just, you know, just sort of been touching and, and min- no, I don't like that word, but it, it, it's sort of, it's part of the art world, um, playing with, you know, um, the, the clay in such a way that, that it takes them away. It, it sort of, it's the idea of de-stressing, you know, that there is a cathartic, therapeutic aspect to, 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 to art, whether it's, it's visual art, music, theater, whatever. And there's somebody trying to get in touch with you. <laughs> right. Do I answer the phone or let it go? <laughs> I would let it go because we're right. just going to finish. I, I love sound. So you right. know, I love the I'm listening to the. And I, I very rarely get phone calls because. Do you want to take. The- no, no, it's okay. It's just that <laughs> this is all I have. I have a landline. I don't have a cell phone. I choose deliberately not to have a cell phone, you know, so that I can have my privacy. You know, and so uh, when the phone rings, it's kind of a jarring, you know. Ah, uh, see, they've hung up. Well, you'll they'll, get to it in a minute. If if the, if it's important, they'll get back to me. <clears throat> well, I would like to end with these wonderful books that you have, because I always ask my guests what they're reading or what they recommend. So, where do you want to start? <laughs> oh, uh, it's sort of like in in terms of of. I guess reiterating, because a, a, a lot of people who are in the visual arts, there is. There's a lot of reading. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of try, uh, trying to trying to understand. For me, visual art is, is how I navigate my way through the world. You know, And, and uh, being profoundly dyslexic, it takes me forever to read a book. So I don't borrow books from the library. I buy books. And uh, so this was a book that I really, really appreciated called The Reenchantment of Art. And... Uh, it actually impacted other people to the point where she came and uh, gave a talk uh, here in the city um, as, as, as that idea of, of trying to move away from the idea of, of art as product, art as commodity, uh, art as a stock market investment kind of idea, that, that art has this, 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 this key element of, of it is, it's part of, of, of how we survived as people, and, and there's a book here, if I can find it. This one. This one is absolutely amazing, and she does. She talks about the, the, um, les racines, the, the history, you know, where art comes from, why, Homo aestheticus, and it's uh, Ellen Deseniak, and it's a book that, uh, from the academic community, she got a lot of flack, but she, she did, in terms of her, her research, and her perceptions and her, her realization of, of just how vital art is to the survival of people. You know, that, that it's not, it's just not a pretty picture on the wall. You know, if you look at every culture, if you look at every, what do we value? You know, it's the idea of, of, of the making of art, making special, you know, making one another special, making something in our environment special reminding ourselves how, how, how key our relationship with, with nature and the environment is. And if we lose that, we lose it at our, at our peril. Well, so. it comes back to what you said earlier about representation, but it, you, you don't mean representation necessarily in the most obvious sense, but in the larger sense mm-hmm. of, of, of a, how do I connect to all of this? How, how can art help me feel more alive, feel, feel more connected to all kinds of things, each other, but also spaces and places and things not human. Uh, I love the, the, the array of books here, The Sacred Balance. Uh, I've, I've looked at that one, David Suzuki. And um, Did you want to talk about some more of them? Because it's a, it's a nice collection, and it looks like these are your really special books. <laughs> uh, yeah, these, these, uh, there's a lot more than I could drag you into my of little course. library. And, well, I did. But, but yeah, there, there's a lot. Of, this is a more recent one. Uh, in terms of uh, just the the 
the sensibilities, the, the, the words of reciprocity and responsibility, our relationship with nature, you know, that, that, uh, That's, um, that we, we seem to be losing. Sweet yeah. grass, mm-hmm. so that people know. I, I, I would highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. You know, to, to, and just her style of writing, her approach, it's... it's uh, Robin Wall Kimmer. Yeah. yeah, it's very much about storytelling. It's not didactic. It's, it's, she is academic, academically grounded. She's a scientist, but she's also part of the indigenous community, and she very much draws on those sensibilities. You know, so storytelling is, as a way to share, you know, the, the importance of, 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 of nature in our world. This is a, a more recent one, and I have, mm, there's some elements of it that I really like. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You've, you've, have you read it? No, I gave it to my mother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and I gave it to a couple of my, my former students. Uh, it, it's the idea of, of uh, most of it is just common sense. It's things like, you know, like the, just that we read all... out the titles that we know. Oh, I'm about. sorry. This book is called uh, The Creative Act, A Way of Being, and it's by a fellow named Rick Rubin, who is actually a mu- music pr- producer. And so it's not just about the visual arts, it's about music, it's about theater, it's about writing, it's about every idea of people trying to, 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 to use the arts to, to communicate, you know. And, and I think, you know, um, there was a thing that I learned, and I can't even remember, I can't remember the, the prof who, who talked about it, was the idea of Marcel Duchamp had sort of three um, steps if something was to be art what what was to happen and so uh number one it's to be made number two it's to be shown and seen and number three and this is where it becomes really important it becomes the 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 impetus for communication it becomes it creates a dialogue you know so that that people start talking uh it goes beyond the piece itself and it and it it just it, it it encourages people to communicate and and and, spe- and talk with one another, mm. you know, and I've I've always held to that that to me because a lot of people go oh well I can make art but nobody has to see it or you know um, I can make art and and you know three people can see it but I think it really for for art to have the potential and the impact that I think is is especially needed today. Is, is that it becomes an impetus for, for communication, to, to, for people to open up with one another and, and start dialogues. Yeah. Well, we've been dialoguing for about 45 minutes, Don. Um, I, could, I could go all day long, I'm well, sorry. Well, it's fine. I, uh, I like these slower conversations, and I often have second conversations a year later, too. Um, and I appreciate that we did this in your home uh, without a specific agenda. You know, I'm not trying to get you to do anything other than to talk about things that you're interested in and and you've brought a lot of insights to me about um life here in ottawa or in the ottawa region right because i i've lived here for 25 years but i've spent most of my time traveling for the canada council and i don't know the artists here that well now that i'm retired I, i've met you and i've met barbara Quirden, and we're getting to know each other and we might do projects together but at the very least every two months we're going to have a potluck so this idea of art and farming, you know, art and food, mm-hmm. uh, very much connected. And, and so the fact that we can get around in a circle and just talk about what we're doing or what we're scares us or, you know, what excites us, I think there's real merit in that. Of course, there's all these electronic forms that can also be good, but to actually get together in somebody's living room, like a beautiful house here, and, and just feel the privilege of being alive, right, or privilege of... Of breathing fresh air, and which is in and of itself uh, a creative act. Every breath that we take, you know, uh, the relationship of the air coming in and out of our bodies. You know. So, th- I just like talking about those things without um, all the art speak, you know. And the <laughs> let's 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 build, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, arts infrastructure. There's nothing against arts infrastructure, but there's something about the the local connected everywhere in the world. Uh, that's that's critically important. Well, it's it's the idea that they've discovered that <clears throat> in terms of farming practices, that uh, 
nearly 80% of the food that's produced is actually created locally, you know, like in, in many, many countries. Uh, one of the things that if you asked about what I was concerned about in, t in terms of the environment, that was one of the questions. And, yeah. and the first thing I had written about was uh, just discovering about the science of hydrology uh, in terms of water, you know, and water cycles and, and what is happening you know, in, in the local region, the, the frequency of storms, the, the, uh, the veracity of the storms that we're having, how the storms have shifted, how they, the idea of um, we're in an area that seems to have much more water than we actually need right now, where there's other areas that are suffering from horrible droughts, that in terms of the fossil fuel petrochemical industry and the, the, the sort of the, the wave of, of, of what's carried it through in terms of capitalism, uh, how they have disrupted a crucial balance that we have to somehow figure out, um, is there any way we can mitigate it at all? Or do we, you know, simply, you know, in terms of trying to survive what's, what's coming down the road? So just on the, on the news, you know, just seeing, you know, the devastating floods, the, the, the mudslides, the, the, the fires, everything that's happening, this is part of the science of hydrology that is a science that is just flourishing, developing, and giving us the bad news. But in terms of trying to figure out what is the hope and the good news with, with, within what they can offer in terms of what they're learning. Well, I think sometimes of those floods and fires as Mother Earth being very angry at us. You know, if you think of it that way, mm -hmm. and we're the, there's suffering of people and non-humans, and yet I, they, I always come back to listening. You know, if you're paying attention to the, the patterns of of life, we were we're out of balance, mm -hmm. and tremendously out of balance, and in denial. <clears throat> And even if we are all going to perish, how are we going to perish is a good question. Like, how do we want to live uh, future forward, knowing the, the, our disconnection, knowing that we have skills, we have capacities and things to share. Um, it's all part of the, of the, the challenge of, of finding a way to be. You know, well, there was one of my guests, David Maggs, who talked about being as opposed to, you know, sort of doing and producing and... Uh, I think we have it inside of us, and I, I think art has always been an accompaniment, like a, a, a friend, somebody to help us on a way to, it's like we create art, but then the art teaches us, it, it then informs us. Um, anyway, that's been fun to talk. Let's have some tea. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, we'll, we'll talk again. Thank you so much, uh, Don, for this conversation. It's much appreciated. Thank you.